So welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is the last walk of our event today. Uh, if you're only joining us now, again, if you want to ask questions, uh, just uh, we, we do have a Slack channel for the event. You can also ask them on Zoom. Uh, if you would like to write in your questions, you can. You can also ask them live at the end. If you don't, if you do ask them live, you will be in the recording. So if you don't want that to happen, just send, submit them in writing and uh, and add a note that you don't want to read them out. And uh, that said, I think we we can move on to our final speaker of the day, not the last session, but the the last speaker, and that is Victor Ruchanko. Uh, Victor is a principal algorithms researcher at Algorand, where he works on protocols and languages for blockchains. He is a co-author of the Art of Multiprocessor Programming and a recipient of the 2022 Dijkstra Prize in Distributed Computing. Before joining Algorand, he worked at Oracle Labs and Sunwebs in the opposite order, I suppose, where he worked on concurrent algorithms and data structures for shared memory multi multiprocessors and the Fortress programming language. He has authored over 50 papers and holds more than 40 patents, and he received the doctorate in science, uh, doctorate in science uh, a PsyD, well, uh, a doctor ciencia in computer science from MIT with a dissertation on models for weakly consistent memories. Today, you'll be telling us about speculative smart contracts in the Algorand blockchain, uh, which moves some of the work off chain so as to accommodate applications with greater storage and computation requirements than those typically supported by L1 smart contracts. Welcome, Victor, and the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so this is a uh, work that we've been doing in Algorand in the research group at Algorand, theory research group at Algorand for a while. Now, um, Jing Chen leads the group and Morris Hurtahi and Luba Shreer are visiting professors with us. And um, other people on the team that fits on this are John Gennady and Zach Langley and Rio Levine. So um, anyway, so that's, I'm gonna tell you about um, this project that we've been working on, basically to, as Horace says, to move uh, um, some of the work off the chain uh, spec to speculative smart contracts. Uh, it's over here. Okay, so uh, let me just quickly, Put, put things in context because so, I'll have to talk about these a little later. But Algorand, as I guess most of you know, it's a permissionless um, blockchain. It uses a proof of stake, um, a pure proof of stake mechanism that you know gives us in trans transaction finality. It's fast. It's every four and a half seconds. We're planning to get it down to every two and a half seconds soon, but I'm not sure. And it's efficient. Um, uh, and you know, like there's no proof of work puzzles, and we hope to go carbon negative. But I'm not going to try and like elaborate on all the advantages of Algorand itself. What I'm here today today talking to about more is this new thing that we're trying to do, where we don't want to have to do all the work on the Algorand blockchain. We're going to do a lot of it off it. Um, to do that, I have to tell you a little bit about what Algorand already supports. Um, so first of all, we like everyone else, we have a native token, and you can transfer money uh, these algos from uh, one person to another. So here's like a little sample transaction of that. Um, the little Alice on the side, that's like the Signature. So basically, here's the transaction, and Alice signs it. So, like on my notation for that. Okay. In addition, you can actually define uh, user defined tokens on Algorand. Um, that's a kind of a, there's native support for this. Um, and so, same thing. Then you can transfer. You know, like let's say you have defined a USDC token. Um, so you can Alice can transfer that to Bob, and again she would sign it. Um, Algorand allows you to do something called atomic transactions, or they're re in the code, they're called transaction groups, where you can group several of these transactions together and either, either all happen or nothing will happen. So this makes it easy to do atomic transfer, for instance. So Alice wants to give um, $2 for 5,000 micro algos, um, then uh, to Bob, then they can put these two transactions together. Alice signs the part where she's giving 5,000 micro algos to Bob and Bob signs the part where he's giving two USDC to Alice. And this will either both happen or not happen <clears throat> together. Uh, um, we also support something called um, escrow accounts, uh, which is where you can make uh, an account who's governed by a little program a predicate that says, if your transaction meets the following criteria, then it'll be approved. And if not, then it won't. And the sender, the name of the account is basically uh, the uh, hash of the predicate that it, uh, it controls it. Um, and so the in the little box over here in the signature box, it's kind of like, the predicate. It's really written on a different language. I'll get into that a little bit, but doesn't the language is not really that interesting from our perspective for what we're talking about here. So you just think it's just a 
it's just any predicate. Um, it's a predicate just on the transaction, by the way, not on the state of the blockchain. So it can be done, so it can check, be checked outside, not, not knowing what the state of the blockchain is. It can be checked just by looking at the transaction. Um, with these predicates, we call them smart signatures, you can actually do what's called delegation. That is an, an account owner, like a normal signature account, can actually sign one of these predicates and say, okay, if you have this predicate with me signing it, you can attach this to a transaction and that will cause the transaction to be approved. So for instance, Alice will sign uh, the, the predicate over here and then she'll give this to whomever and then Bob can take it actually and, and put it on this transaction, which even though it says the sender's Alice, it's actually Bob who creates it and puts the signature here. It's um, authorized because Alice signed the predicate for which uh, this transaction meets. <clears throat> okay, then the next thing you can do is um, we actually do have kind of layer one smart contracts. Uh, they're called applications on the blockchain. And uh, these are basically, uh, yeah, just like, just what you normally think of. It's actually as, uh, <clears throat> just a small program that, um, and invoking this, these contracts is just another transaction. Okay, so in, in Ethereum, all of these things, except for the native transfers are handled by smart contracts. But as I mentioned earlier in Algorand, these first two are really handled by, um, have native support for them. And this follows our general idea, which is that we should make native support for things that are common to make them those things easy. And, they, and actually just these two features alone eliminate a whole bunch of uh, things that people use smart contracts for, like hash time logs and stuff like that, just to do atomic transfers. Um, those are all just atomic transfers. It can be done trivially with these atomic transactions. And, um, you know, uh, um, uh, ERC-20 tokens can be mostly done by user-defined tokens in Algorand, so you don't have to roll your own, basically. Um, however, we do have these other three things are, you know, they're, there's kind of native support and there's an AVM that runs these things, but you do have to write the particular programs for them, just like you would an EVM. Uh, and so, because the predicates, you get to specify what they are, so you get um, um, a richer language to do them in. Uh, it uses, as I said, this language called Teal, um, and there's two versions of it. There's one that runs stateless, that is, it just looks at the, just the transaction or the transaction group, if it's in part of a group. Um, and then there's another stateful version, which is what the, what the smart contracts actually run, the applications actually run. Um, okay, um, and as I think I alluded to earlier, there's actually pretty stringent storage and computation limitations on what can run in the AVM because we don't want this to um, impact the rest of the chain, and as I'll describe right now. So. What happens when smart contracts are executed in the, on normally, like an EVM, for instance, in Ethereum, right, is you have a whole bunch of transactions. I'll put, like make small ones for these simple payment or the native kind of transactions. And then these larger kind of smart contract calls. And in Ethereum, they're just all mixed together and you just send them all to the committee and the committee just makes up blocks consisting of a mix of whatever it gets. Um, and everyone has to execute all of these transactions and these simple payments must wait for the, you know, if the contracts come before them, they must uh, wait for them to execute. And these uh, contracts can be pretty expensive and that comes, sometimes comes up with why gas prices are expensive and all that kind of stuff. So all stuff I think you guys are very familiar with. Um, and here the state of application is done by everyone re-executing all the contracts. Um, what we say is we don't wanna do all this work. We can do some of the work off chain, right? And what sort of work should we do? Well, you know, Basically, not all smart contracts need to be done layer one. They might be too big, right? That's a huge problem. We keep a lot of state on the chain. Um, it might, they might run for too long. And so again, you're delaying a lot of things behind it. Um, they might be so esoteric that we don't actually want to kind of uh, run them by the time, you know, they're, they're going to come for a little bit and then go away. Um, and so we don't want to put a lot of native support for these things. And they might just be too complex. I mean, writing in Ethereum or an AVM is, you know, writing a stack-based language is fairly low level thinking. And it'd be nice to have a higher kind of level language to write these things in. So um, these are all reasons you might not want to run your smart contracts at layer one. Um, so what we propose is a speculative off-chain smart contract execution. The idea is to move arbitrary, large user-defined code out of the critical path of the consensus protocol um, and instead execute them basically off-chain. So the high level idea here, and I'll go into more detail as we go on, but the high level idea here is that um, you write the smart contract in some higher level language, and we actually have a variant of the Clarity language from Blockstack. Um, but as I'll tell you later, as I'll 
mentioned later, it's fairly orthogonal. You can you know choose whatever language, and if, as long as you have a VM for that language, you can implement it. You could put it in the place here. Um, and this contract, this language, actually lets you uh, read and write the actual ledger state. That's the state on the blockchain. Um, and so that's a bit tricky with speculation. So that will be a lot of what I talk about. And um, it also, of course, you can maintain your own storage, and that's maintained by the off-chain nodes that actually do this. Um, okay, and then when you would actually want to invoke a transaction, what you do is you put a call, a co contract call transaction on the chain. You say, please invoke this transaction. And then there are separate sets of nodes, these contract execution committee nodes, who are just watching the blockchain to see these call, looking for these call transactions. And they basically look at the call transactions and say, oh, here's one, and then they execute it. And I'll talk more about how we do that in a bit. Okay. After they execute it, um, there's going to be some effects on the local store, on the storage of that contract, and possibly if the contract calls other contracts on those contracts as well, right? Um, but that's all off-chain storage. But there's, as I said, the contracts are allowed to read and write the ledger state. And so there might be effects on the ledger state. And right now, they're all just doing it on their own local thing. They're not touching the ledger state because we're doing it off-chain. So they have to write them back. And so we call these things that they're writing back, we call this the effects transaction. And um, a single contract might actually make multiple changes to the ledger state um, at the same time. I mean, the state on the blockchain at the same time might make, make multiple transactions, basically. But that's OK. We can make sure they all happen together because, as I mentioned, um, Algorand supports atomic transactions. Um, so you can say these are all either all go in or all don't go in. OK, so let me just give a high level uh, picture of that because maybe there's a lot of words. Um, so basically, you can imagine that these little yellow, uh, orange dots, the round orange things are contract call transactions. And then the uh, uh, little squares are regular transactions. And everyone's just sending them into the, con the consensus committee as normal. And the consensus committee just fills up the block with them just as normal. So contract call transactions, it just views them as normal transactions. Okay. Um, these are just calls. It's not actually executing these calls. It doesn't even know the language that these uh, uh, contracts are written in necessarily. Okay. Instead, we've got a contract execution committee that's watching for these, these um, contract call transactions, and it executes it in this virtual machine that the contract committee has. Okay. And then it, in order to execute it, remember, it can read the, the blockchain state. So what state does it do read? Well, we don't want it to have a moving uh, uh, basis. You know, it, it wants to have a consistent view of the world. So basically, we take a single um, snapshot at the basically where we, where we start executing the, the bot block uh, uh, the contract calls, and we say, okay, we snapshot the blockchain at that point, and we run these uh, um, contract calls with respect to that uh, snapshot. Um, as I'll discuss later, we can actually run multiple ones. We can batch them, um, and uh, that, and then they would, you know, the earlier ones will see the, the later ones will see the effects of the earlier ones. Okay, and then after they've done this, they produce a, basically a set of effects transactions. Um, one for every contract call um, that they executed. Now, I say effects transaction. Remember, each one of these effects transaction could have multiple effects because there's a, they're effectively an atomic transaction or a, a transaction group that can have multiple effects. Um, and there's one of these for every call, call that you do. Okay, so that's the basic um, uh, setup. Oh, yeah, and then you write these effects transactions into the block, into, like, say, maybe block five is now when it's ready. And it sends this constant the consensus committee, which puts them in, which just views them as any ordinary transactions and puts them in the block. Okay, so that's the basic story, the high level story. Um, you know, if you take anything away from this, that's the story we're going with. But there are a number of issues. If it was just that simple, then it would be done. Um, but uh, there are several challenges that arise because of this. Um, okay, what are they? One is speculation introduces the possibility of inconsistency. And that inconsistency can come up in the ledger state or in the contract storage. Um, I'll discuss each of these points later in more detail, um, but let's just go quickly over them. Another is this question of authorization. How, why do we trust the, the transaction uh, contract execution committee? And how do we know that when you know, the contract execution committee sends an effects transaction to the consensus committee, how does the consensus committee know that this is actually from the contract execution committee? And another kind of more subtle question, perhaps, is how do I know? I mean, the contract committee is saying transfer money from Alice to Bob, but Alice needs to sign uh, transactions that transfer money from her to Bob. So why are the transactions that the contract committee uh, attests to, why are they valid? Um, okay, then we want to talk about the cost of 
um, executing off chain in this way? What are the overheads introduced by this whole scheme that I, we're proposing? And also, um, very briefly, how how do we how do the users pay for this off chain execution? Um, so let's go through each of these points. Um, okay, so uh, kind of the main problem we are struggling with is basically this um, inconsistency speculation, right? So what, why is there this inconsistency? Well, let's just suppose that Alice, um, you know, one of these calls has the effect that Alice has to pay Bob uh, 10 USDC. And at the end of block two, where uh, we took the snapshot, Alice had 20 USDC. So the contract says, we can do this. We've got 20 USDC, she has to pay 10, no problem. Okay, but somewhere between block two and five, um, Alice puts an ordinary transaction to pay Charlie 15 USDC. Okay, so now when the effects transaction of Alice reaches the blockchain in block five, Alice only has five USDC. And so the transaction saying pay Bob 10 has to fail. There's just not enough money to it. There's nothing you can possibly do to make that succeed. So, um, so it's going to fail. And remember, during speculation, it was all being done off chain. So there's no record on the chain that Alice is supposed to pay Bob $10. $10. And so there's nothing to prevent the $15 transfer from Alice to Charlie from, from happening. Okay, so this, this um, speculation has to, um, has to fail. Um, okay, so this introduced a, work, um, a window of vulnerability. And what do we do about this? Well, our policy is just fail the entire contract call. We don't want part of the contract call to be done, right? Um, because then there would be inconsistency. But if we fail the whole thing, you know, going back to the whole transactional system idea, right? If you fail the whole thing, then the, the uh, execution state is fine. We just have to note that this guy has failed. Um, okay, well, that might seem pretty bad. You know, what about progress, right? We were going along and, um, and it failed. Well, our view is that, um, you know, you shouldn't, you should, this kind of problem happen in real life all the time. You know, like for instance, you write checks, you know, check, personal checks can bounce. Just don't write the sum of your personal checks should not exceed your balance, right? Just make sure they don't bounce. And the same thing that actually happens to the blockchain already, right? For instance, when I look and I say, I'm gonna send $10 or you know, I'm gonna have Alice send me $10, I look at it, it seems fine, right? But by the time it actually gets to the blockchain, there is some delay. And so if that delay is big enough, there might maybe some other transaction happen in the meantime. So already this kind of speculation happens and we deal with it just fine. And the reason we deal with it is because at a higher level, we know that we're if we're if we're honest players, um, then you know all the transactions we've issued together should be consistent no matter what order they happen in. That's that's something that you as a user should generally uh, satisfy. Okay. So as you said, the speculation already happens in the blockchain, and when the chain is slow and there's not too many transactions, we don't really notice it. But when the chain is very fast or it's um, there's congestion, then we might really notice the speculation. But the solution is just to make the users you know, users should just be good players, right? They should be honest players. Um, so they shouldn't write bad checks. They shouldn't depend on highly volatile state. Um, and if necessary, if they're saying, yes, I'm going to depend on this person giving me this money, then I should escrow to make sure we put that money into escrow so that it's guaranteed to be there at a the later time. Right? So basically our, our, our policy, our feeling is that these, most of these speculation failures are easy to avoid and uh, just require the user to actually avoid them. Um, and, and so in that case, we just um, fail the entire transaction. And as I said, we'll, we'll discuss later what happens when we do that. Okay, so the second kind of inconsistency that can happen is um, <clears throat> in the local store, in the contract store, the storage of each contract itself, right? And one question you might ask is, you know, there's many nodes executing this, in order, and I'll talk about more of that in a bit. bit. There's many nodes executing the contract um, call. How do they know that each of them has the right storage? They're working for the same thing. Maybe they got corrupt, or maybe they came up later and they say, I now need the storage. Someone please give it to me. How do they have the right storage? Well, the way we ensure that is we actually keep a commitment to the storage state basically on the chain itself. So therefore, of course, they, if they don't have this, the storage, um, the correct storage, they can't generate it. But if someone gives it to them, they can verify it. it's the correct one. It's the one they're supposed to have um, by looking at the blockchain for every, each contract will have a little commitment in, in the blockchain. Uh, we'll have a commitment to the storage in the blockchain. Um, okay, what about contract calls whose effects transactions fail to commit on the blockchain? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, this actually means we have to have speculative storage. And let me just show you a picture for this. Okay, so if I'm not doing speculation, then as, 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 as soon as I've done a contract call, I write basically 
back to the contract storage and I just keep on writing this way um, directly. But with speculation, what happens is I'm writing to a speculative cache, right? But I don't actually know that these, um, these effects transactions are gonna go through. So what I have to do is I, I'm writing to this cache and while I'm executing in speculative mode, then I'm assuming they're all done. All these writes happen. And I wanna write the speculation cache in order to be able to read the writes of earlier contract calls in my same uh, speculation batch. Um, and then when the corresponding effects transaction appears on the chain, then I write that part, the, the write set corresponding to that particular contract into the actual contract state. And this again introduces a sort of speculation kind of failure possibility, because it might be that a contract call one and contract call two, you know, contract call two depends on contract call one. And if contract call one fails for, you know, because it was by a bad player, then contract call two will fail, not because it was bad, but because contract one, whose state it was depending on, was bad. This, we still need contract two to fail, but this should not cause, this should not be kind of blamed, contract call two should not be blamed for it. It's just, it's the fault of contract call one. Okay, so again, we need to kind of have this, watch out for this speculation. We have to make sure we do this right. Okay, um, another question you can ask is, uh, we asked earlier, or two questions we asked is, why is it, Contract, why do we trust the contract committee, execution committee, and how do we know that a particular effects transaction is approved by that committee? And our idea for this is to elect nodes um, to the contract committee, um, just as we do for the consensus protocol. We, that is, we use the VRF to do a cryptographic certition to randomly select um, uh, participants, right, from a, a large group, so that, um, and we select a fairly large committee, like 150 or so, and, um, and you know, we did some probabilistic analysis to show that that's good enough to give us kind of good, very good guarantees about the safety and liveness of the, um, of the, of the committees. The reason they don't need to be as big as in the consensus, actually, if, um, if you know the Algorand's consensus is about 2,000 nodes, but the reason this one can be quite a bit smaller is because um, they don't actually, they, they don't have to like, well, they, they have to agree on the result, but the result is deterministic because all of the contracts are run deterministically. So they don't actually have to do agreement in the same way. They, they know what the results are. They just have to make sure that they're actually computing it um, correctly. Okay, well, so each selected node certifies the result. And then if you get enough certifications, then that constitutes a certificate. And then these certificates are validated by the layer one node. So they know that if they get a certificate, then they know that they have a, va a valid transaction that's from the contract execution committee. And they trust the contract execution committee because it was elected in the same way that the consensus committees are elected, um, just with a lower, um, smaller number of them because the, the, um, the guarantees are different. Are, are, are there, because we have stronger um, guarantees upfront to it. So, so we can have fewer committee members to, get, to guarantee that the certificate's correct. Okay, um, this certificate validation is expensive and, and we amortize this by batching, which as I, we saw earlier, we, we do actually multiple calls for one at one time for one speculation, do multiple calls um, so that we can basically amortize the cost of the certificate validation and all the generation of all the um, committees that we're doing. Okay, uh, the other question I asked was how do the, how can the contract committee, execution committee actually authorize transactions from other accounts? And this is where we use um, the delegation that I mentioned earlier, right? Alice signs a predicate saying, okay, the contract execution committee is allowed to post transactions on my behalf, basically. And they can actually specify, you know, maybe they can even put more rules about like what kind of transactions they're going to do. This is akin to, if you know, the operating system's idea of capabilities, this is kind of like that. Alice gives a capability to the contract execution committee saying, you're allowed to do these things. And because um, Algorand, um, the, the layer one blockchain supports these delegation, um, then this whole thing works. Um, yeah, um, these capabilities um, that uh, I just mentioned, they are actually included. So the sender includes them in the contract call transaction. When they make the call, they say, and here's the capabilities you might need to actually execute, you know, to actually authorize the transaction effects that, you're going, that are gonna come out of this transaction. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about overhead. Um, the overhead, there's two kinds of overhead. There's kind of the direct overhead of um, basically, you're now making two transactions uh, for every contract call, right? One to say, please make this contract call, and then one that instantiates the effects. 
Um, if the contract that you wanted to execute is very simple, very small, very cheap to execute, then it's just cheaper to implement that in layer one. That's what we have layer one contracts for. Um, just do that in layer one. But if it's going to be more complex or you want you know, to have more control over things um, or, or um, yeah, if it's going to be more complex in this way, then the point is that it should be cheaper to do those two single call, those two transactions than it will be to do the, um, to do the, the more expensive contract itself. At least many of the things that you want to do in the contract will be more expensive. So um, you cheap ones with layer one applications, but otherwise um, that should be no problem. Um, but the certificate validation is pretty expensive. We, we estimate you need about 150 um, certificate certifications, 150 um, nodes to certify every um, batch of transactions, right? And, it's, and a single certification involves signature check and a VRF check. So, you know, that's about like one transaction worth of things, maybe a little bit more. Um, so uh, you have to do 150 of those, that's pretty expensive. But the idea again is if, if, if these things are expensive enough and we batch several of them together, then we amortize the cost of doing that kind of, and also, you know, the, the committee has to do kind of uh, gossip messages amongst themselves. Um, it's, uh, it's just a single round of gossiping. So it's cheaper again than the consensus, but they still need to do it. So, um, so uh, the hope is that batching will make up for this um, expense. Um, we are in the state right now where we have a prototype implementation, but it's not at the point where we actually can produce performance results. So we're working on that. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, batching introduces, we kind of have to go back a little bit. Batching actually introduces a new kind of failure, which I alluded to earlier, which is that if um, contract call two depends on the result of contract call one, then if contract call one fails, then contract call two will also fail because not because it was bad, but because it was depending on the results of something that it had no reason to believe was bad. So um, in that case, we actually will say contract one, call one actually failed, but contract call two, um, we say that we, we, we um, put on a list to retry because it didn't fail for its fault. It, it failed because of our batching basically, and because contract call one was bad. Um, so we actually retry those ones. Um, but notice that because you only fail if someone else failed before you, we get progress. Sorry, answering the question I asked earlier, what about progress? You're still getting progress because every time you go through a batch, there's at least one bad guy who, if, if anyone fails, it's because there's at least one bad guy who you no longer have to do again. Because if you failed before, you're not going to run him again. You should probably fail again. Um, okay. The last kind of topic to discuss here, there's many things we could discuss, but um, in the, looking at the time, is kind of how do we pay for these things? Um, you know, like in Ethereum, you basically say, here's my gas that I'm willing to, you know, here's a budget I'm willing to give you in a gas. But Ethereum charges you basically exactly what you're going to pay right up front because it does the um, contract right then and there. But we can't do that because we're doing it speculatively. So instead, what we do is we say, every time you make a contract call transaction, that is, you're saying, please do this contract call for me, um, you're required to put money down, basically. You put money in escrow as a deposit um, that the uh, execution you know, uses um, to see that you have enough money to, to, to pay it. And then when you're executing, just like in Ethereum or any other smart contract system, you, every instruction is a cost that's deterministic, right? And so you just accumulate that cost. If the cost ever goes over your deposit, then you say, this contract call failed. You say, it's, it's failed. You put a failure, I'm not retrying it. And you just take the whole deposit, okay? But if it succeeds, then you refund whatever you didn't spend. Um, so now if the contract call fails, as I said earlier, for any reason, either because it fails in this kind of mode because you ran over the deposit or you did something that it could tell was illegal right away, um, or because the transaction, the effects transaction itself fails, you know, like it looked good at speculation time, but when it gets to the blockchain, the world has changed and it's no longer good. In either of those cases, we say the transaction fails and we just confiscate the entire deposit. So we are, again, by confiscating the entire deposit, we're basically pushing the onus back onto the caller to say, make sure your call is going to be good. Um, now, if you want to write a contract that you want to give the uh, caller more confidence, like, you know, to be able to um, do it without being worried that their entire deposit is going to be confiscated, then that's a deal between you and the contract writer that you have to kind of mediate to figure out who pays for that. Um, but uh, we charge whoever it is that makes the call. Okay. Um, so that's all there is I was going to say about this thing. Um, I guess really the last thing I'm going to say about it is 
Um, some issues we ran into um, for uh, implementation of this whole system, as I said, we're working on prototype implementation. Um, as I already alluded to, many of these things are already um, uh, enabled by features that already exist in the blockchain. For instance, um, we're using layer one apps and delegation scripts to the capabilities and also to manage the commitment storage that I mentioned earlier, where we're storing commitments to the contract storage um, in there. And um, also, uh, we're actually also managing how we tell which of the contract, uh, we're sending whole batches of, um, of, of effects transactions to the blockchain. And so we have to say which one, which effects transactions we're authorizing, layer two is authorizing. And so we also use an app for that kind of stuff. Uh, we did have to add some layer one support, some of which we want anyway, um, Metro, which we want anyway, actually. One is for instance, uh, we didn't used to have layer one support for VRF verification. So uh, this, um, which we need for the election for the specific validation. This is a functionality that many people want. So we are gonna add it anyway. Um, but one nice thing about this whole project, aside from that, we hope that the speculative execution is itself a great contribution. But one nice thing about it also is it kind of, it's a, it's a kind of a needy application. So um, we're trying to do everything in layer two. So it says, look, we want to do this in layer two. We need some support at layer one in order to do it. And this VF verification is one of them. And another thing is we need a kind of transaction try. We're going to say, look, I want to try this transaction, but if it doesn't work, don't just throw it away. Instead, put this other transaction on you know, do something simpler. And that's what we need to do the confiscation. We say, if this, the effects transaction failed, don't just throw it away. I mean, do throw that one away, but instead put in a transaction that says, take all the money in the deposit that was deposited. Um, so we need this operation and this, um, yeah, that's an operation we need for our current approach. Um, as I said, these are not yet in, um, in layer one and we hope that they will be sometime soon. Um, the last point I want to note about the implementation is that it's actually very modular. I, I didn't emphasize that I was going through, but if you kind of followed along what we're doing, I didn't even talk at all about what the VM, the, the contract, the layer two VM, uh, contract VM is like, because it doesn't matter. It's just, it's something that's run, you know, the layer one doesn't even care. It's just, you know, text for it, right? Um, it's just sent to the layer two nodes who have to know what their own language that they're running are. We have a specific language in mind. The language does have to meet certain characteristics that are, necessary for blockchains, but atypical for standard programming languages. Like it's gotta be completely deterministic and it has to specify the exact cost for everything. The price you're gonna charge, whether that's the actual cost or not, it's a separate question. But you know, you have to specify a cost for everything. So there's atypical requirements for regular programming languages, but for um, smart contract languages, as you know, they're pretty standard. Um, uh, you know, that that's completely orthogonal to all the things we're talking about. And even this complicated scheme I said of doing certificate validation, to authorize the contract execution committee, that's pretty orthogonal too. If you wanted to say, look, there's just this guy I trust, you know, to, to run all these contracts, you know, maybe it's, you know, um, Citibank or something like that. I mean, I'm not sure I trust Citibank to do it, but, you know, supposing you trust someone to do it, um, you know, and they could just sign it and you say, it's fine. I just accept that if they sign it, it's good, right? Um, because I trust them for whatever reasons I do. You could have that and that would be a completely orthogonal piece. Everything else would just work the same except you wouldn't need all the certificate validation should be much cheaper. Um, same thing with the speculation. I mean, all of these are kind of independent of the speculation thing that I spent most time discussing. And also, I haven't really talked about it, but you can imagine that the contract storage um, we're hoping can also be kind of, um, is also largely orthogonal. We haven't, there are some issues there that we haven't completely worked out. So, um, so right now we have that tied in with the speculation uh, framework, um, but, um, it's mostly orthogonal, and I think we can make it more fully orthogonal um, going forward. So um, that's still a work in progress. Okay, that's really it, actually. Um, so in sum, I, I, we described um, a solution. We say basically for very simple um, uh, contracts, you should just use our layer one smart contract story. But for more complex user-defined you know, computation, we have this story for doing off-chain speculatively in a way that we think uh, preserves basically the uh, integrity of the underlying blockchain by not putting these heavyweight transactions, um, you know, gating you know, that will cause other things that will uh, to be blocked by them. So these other things are expensive, but they're done off chain. And just when the results are ready, they're put on chain. Um, yeah, I think I've said all of this already. So uh, that's it. If you have any questions, I think we have a few minutes.
indeed, we, we do have a few minutes this time. Uh, thank you, Victor. We do have a couple of questions already in Slack from Marco. So I think we can yeah. start with those. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, if you could read them, I can't actually look at my Slack while this is displayed. So yeah, Marco yeah. will read them. Yeah. I, I, will, I will paraphrase them. So uh, assuming that uh, contracts can call other contracts, once you fail a contract, uh, do things get messy? Um, it's, it's a very, very vague question, but I hope you see where I'm going. Yeah, uh, that's right. If contracts call other contracts, then right now we have a very simple scheme in mind, which is just that um, you have to have the guy that's done before you succeed. Um, no, I'm sorry. I take that back. There's two different things. We, we do actually execute them in order, although that we can actually relax too. But, um, but every contract has its own commitment in storage. So if one contract fails, but the contract after contract call after it doesn't access the state of the pre, of the contract call that failed before it, then it never looks at that contract call state, and so it, it succeeds just fine. Um, but if the contract but if so if I have contract call one and contract call two, if two accesses the state of contract call one, right? Then it and contract call one changed the state. Um, then contract call two when it runs, it will say, the first thing it will do is say, let me check all the commitments of all the guys that I'm expecting that I, I that I'm going to touch. That I'm going to read. So I'm going to check that their commitments are what I expect them to be. Right? And if they are what I expect them to be, then I know they're good. It doesn't matter whether they did something else, if they, you know, they changed or whatever. As long as their commitments are the same as I expect, I just say that's great. And I go on. So you'll succeed in this way. So you'll only fail if the thing that you if the thing that failed was something you actually depended on. So it's 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 kind of exactly what you'd hope for in that in that regard. Now, what we don't do is it might be that inside the contract state, you know, some part of the contract state changed, but not the part I was touching. And right now we treat that monolithically. You could imagine that we'd have a more, a richer story of how we store the commitments for every contract storage, for every contract to allow you to kind of say, yes, I'm actually only accessing this part of your storage. You know, please just tell me whether that part failed, um, whether that part changed or not. Um, we don't currently have that story, but that's just a, um, a more elaborate commitment story. Um, we could easily in, in, incorporate that if we had it, if, if someone said what they wanted in that regard, um, but you would have to write the contract to do it. Thanks, thanks. And, and, and one question, if an off-chain transaction fails because of this off-chain, on-chain concurrency, basically it's what happens to an off-chain transaction? Is it retried? Is it up to the user? No, generally speaking, you fail because your effects transaction is now invalid where it was valid at speculation time. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, we say that's your fault. That's like that's like double spending. That, you know, like it's you issued more checks. So we fail and we take your money, basically. We're like, mm, uh, be better at managing your accounts, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Um, I, you know, you, we, that's a policy choice. You could have a different policy choice. That policy choice means makes things simpler for us. Um, you could imagine you'd want to have a, a different policy choice, but um, we'd have to think about, I, I, you know, it's not even the technical aspect of it. I would say it's more like what the policy aspect of it is what I really want to think about. I think almost any policy you want, we could probably enforce. Um, it, uh, you know, if you wanted to like not confiscate all your money at that point, um, we could probably do that. We just have to say how it is that you, what you want to do instead. Okay. And maybe the last uh, question, which is not a question, but a request, may, may, if you can post the, I guess you have a paper describing this, maybe I missed the title of the paper. If you can just post it after the discussion to the Slack, that would be great. I, I'm sorry, can you say again? I don't okay. have, a, we don't have a paper of this yet. So. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, um, yeah, it's still kind of work in progress. Okay. So basically um, no other specific documentation specification apart from what you just told us today. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Jing has given a talk about this somewhere else. So there's another, there are like fr talk fragments hanging about in some places, but, but yes, there's no, you know, we have internal documentation, but nothing that we've written up for um, external um, consumption. Um, we will soon, I think, um, okay. but you know, we're, as I said, we're trying to get this prototype implementation kind of going, then we can start to do performance kind of evaluations. And, you know, all performance evaluations are somewhat suspect until they're running the actual chain, but at least we can kind of do kind of preliminary sort of like, okay, at least in proof of concept, you know, it's, it's viable, right? Like, so uh, thanks to that. Um, yeah. Thanks. So yeah, let's go with the, uh, the other question. Yeah, so yeah, there's thanks. a question. Giuliano has a hand. Yeah. Um... My question is, uh, so if I understand correctly, this allows to offload computation 
uh, from the main chain. But as for any storage that is not transient, it's still going to end up on the on the main chain. Is that right? I'm sorry. No, no. Um, storage that's not transient. Uh, I mean, there's there's storage that like you can manipulate storage on the main chain, but you can also keep storage that's not transient off chain. It's just kept by the nodes that are doing contract execution. They're the only ones who do it. And as I said, I think we'd like to have a story that's ever, even better than that, in which you actually um, can say there's a third party storage for it. But there are some trickiness with third party storage that you know we haven't um, worked out completely. So I don't want to commit to it, um, but I think we'd like to eventually have such a thing. Um, I see. So, so the state is actually partitioned in two. That's right. There's, you, there's on-chain storage and off-chain storage. And the off-chain storage, our only representation of that is a single commitment on the blockchain. So it's represented on the blockchain, but just in this kind of like as a you know hash, basically, of some kind. Um, and like I said to Marco, it could be that you'd have a more sophisticated thing. So it'd be like multiple hashes because you could kind of say, you know, you could ask for parts of it have changed without asking whether, the, you know, anything changed. Um, or, you know, it could be a Merkle route, and then you could do Merkle paths or something like that. Um, uh, There's some state that has to be there explicitly if it's going to be accessed by native uh, operations, right? Oh, well, so native guys can't access the, the contract, the layer two contract state. They cannot do this, generally speaking. They can only look at the commitment, which is, you know, opaque to them pretty much, um, you know. But uh, they, so they do look at the commitment because they need to check the commitment. Um, to make sure that it's what they're what they're expecting, so the native guys are doing that stuff, but that's all they can do, um, unless they actually have been tracking the. You know, it's all public, so in principle they could all run the things and do it, but without actually executing the contracts, they can't tell what the contract storage state is at all. That's right. just not available to them. Okay, um, and so but layer yeah. two guys can do the other, can look at both things because they they are executing all the contracts. Okay, and, and could you imagine having several contract execution committees? Yes, uh, we definitely do. In fact, they, they could be running concurrently. If they're running on separate disjoint sets of contracts, no problem. And then, then there's no problem at all because these are just all layer two solutions. So you're just in your land of contracts and I'm in my land of contracts. If we wanted them to interoperate, it's a little bit trickier. So then we have to talk about how we do that. Uh, I, I, that's too open a question, I think, for me to give a kind of a coherent right. answer to, but, um, but yes. Cool, thank you. We definitely want to support that. Okay, fantastic. We have one final question, even though we're already at time. I'll let Matei ask the question. Just please avoid many round hey, trips. We can continue in Slack. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you, George. And hi, Victor. It's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, I want to once more return to the to the misspeculations. I'm wondering whether it's really always possible to blame the user in a way for misspeculation, or whether there can whether you can imagine a legitimate case where where in best faith the user submits a transaction and it just gets misspeculated for I don't know uh, network asynchrony and then this this transaction gets lost in the network and or delayed for for ten years and then it shows up and then. And then the user gets some money. See, <laughs> well, uh, I I think it's possible to imagine some circumstances, but it's a question of what we believe about about users. So people should not write contracts that have that kind of property. Is what I'd say, roughly speaking. You shouldn't use contracts that have that property. They should instead escrow stuff or things like that, so that that doesn't happen. That that should be the mode that people use them in, right? So, is it possible to write such things? Yes, I think there are legitimate applications that sort of maybe the most naive way you'd write them would have that property. But you shouldn't write them in that naive way, right? Like you should write them in a more sophisticated way. But as I said, you could want to have a different policy and then the contract themselves could say, yeah, we'll refund you your fees or whatever. Like, just like, you know, um, various different things do, you know, like if you would say, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna send you some money, right? Um, a lot of things will say, well, we'll send you your money back if it turns out not, you didn't like it, even if it's not our, our fault, whatever, right? So you could have such things. And so we're saying, we're putting that on the, on the contract um, writers to do. We could implement a different policy, um, and I'm not opposed to thinking about such a policy. We just thought that it isn't clear what that other policy would be. It's a little bit hard to know. You know, so if you tell me, here's the policy I actually want, we could probably implement that. It's not that hard to imagine. It's just hard to know how we're going to get the contracts to tell us what their policy they want is if it's not this policy. Right on. That, 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 make, that makes complete sense. I was just, I was just wondering whether if my the transaction gets stuck in the network and then I actually yeah, don't I mean also 
it's not unlike it's not likely to actually get stuck because Algorand basically has a validity window for transactions. They can't be valid right. for more than a certain amount of time. So after that amount of time, they're just going to drop. Okay, that, that drop then. Yeah, that that actually. So it can't be stuck for years. It can only be stuck for a thousand rounds, which is by an hour. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. All right, fantastic. Uh, thank you all for the questions. Thank you, Victor, for for your great presentation.